Good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. For those moms who are here with your family and uh, friends, I'm grateful for you and hope this day is a special day for you. Our scripture reading today is from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Let me uh, pray and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would, uh, by your Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we might behold the wonder of your word and to be changed by it for good. And we pray in the way David prayed in the Psalms and ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts are found worthy in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Listen to the word of God from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this was also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom. And how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my home. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great. And surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done. And the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. The prophet Isaiah declared that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are lots of things that we do to experience happiness, and most of them work. I know when that phrase, I'm in my happy place, is probably something most of us have thought about, and I know a lot of us have posted about on social media. I get that. I mean, when we can go to St. Augustine, and I can get my kayak out in the salt water and fish, and it's quiet, and it's beautiful, and osprey are di diving into the water, and dolphins, you know, aren't afraid of kayaks, and they go rolling by, and it's just an incredible scene, catching fish. I mean, I'd say that, that that's a happy place, and it works. I, I don't recall ever having an unhappy time doing that. Doing something to make you happy usually works, even Irish Spring, <laughs> which for those watching, it's just a, a note that went to somebody's ringtone was Irish Spring song. It's usually easy to find happiness. But the problem is, it's not finding happiness that's difficult. The problem is finding happiness that sticks. See, I think you're probably familiar with the term that I feel like I coined myself. Maybe I heard from somebody else. 
that no vacation goes unpunished. Like what I mean by that is like every great weekend you have, what's coming? Monday morning. It could be the best weekend ever, but what's coming? Monday morning. You got to go to work. You got to go back to doing the things you do all week long. And what happens to your happiness? Well, it's swallowed up in a commute or things you got to do that you heard about over the weekend or built up, phone calls, whatever, annoying people, whatever it is. There's something that happens. New toys, whatever version, whether it's clothes or cars or whatever, they lose their sparkle, they lose their shine. I mean, come on, if you've been a parent, how many toys have you given to your kids that get played with for a little while and then end up just sitting in a box somewhere? And they go, I'm bored. It's because happiness doesn't stick when that's the kind of happiness that we're looking for. It's easy to find happiness. It's hard to make happiness stick. And what you think about God and the existence of God makes all the difference in figuring out how to find a happiness that can stick. See, that, that we're in the sermon series. If you've been with us before, you've, you're well aware of this. We've been doing it since Easter. We're in the sermon series inspired by the book uh, by Tim Keller called Making Sense of God. And what Keller's proposition is, is that to believe that God exists and to be- believe that God does not exist are both propositions of faith. Contrary to the people's opinion who don't believe God exists, that's not an evidence-based idea. Because in all of our best testing and all of our best scientific processes, they're all limited by the natural realm in which they were designed to work, and God lives beyond that. And there's no test that we have and that we'll ever have to apply the scientific process to things beyond this natural world. And so both propositions at the fundamental level or decisions about faith. And so then the question to ask is, which decision of faith has the best prospects of satisfying my deepest needs? And so we've walked through a lot of them, and our question today is, does belief or non-belief in the existence of God offer the best path for sustained happiness? Now, the text I just read to you is from Ecclesiastes, which is kind of like the emo uh, book of the Bible. And if emo is a culture and a style that's kind of cynical. If you don't know what it is, ask your kids. They will tell you. And in Solomon is writing in this letter about his experiences in pursuing happiness. He talks about feasting. He talks about building things. He had houses, vineyards, gardens, parks, pools. How many have ever thought to yourself, if we had a pool in our backyard, we would be so happy? How many of you with pools thought, if I could just fill that thing with dirt and not have to fix anything else with the pool, then we would be so happy? He has wealth. He has possessions. He has herds and flocks, he says, beyond anyone else. He has silver and gold beyond anyone else. He has music. I mean, how many people to get in a happy place turn on the music? He had music. He had whatever version of Tay-Tay that existed at that time. He had that person, and that's Taylor Swift because we live now in the A-T-A-L according to my children. Like he had it. If music's the thing, he had it. He had pleasure, physical pleasure. He had 300 concubines. And if you don't know what a concubine is, you should ask your neighbor after the service. He had relationships beyond anybody's count. He had 700 wives. I'm sure they were all really great, meaningful relationships. But if relationships were going to make it happen, he had enough to test whether or not 
that's how you become happy. He had peace. There was no war. He had <clears throat> 1,400 chariots, 1 Kings says, and 12,000 horsemen distributed around the nation to preserve the peace of Israel. There were no border conflicts until he turned away from God and started building uh, places for his 700 women to worship in the means of the religious culture they came from, which was not worshiping the God of Israel. Until then, he had peace, and he had fame. First Kings says that the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon. Who today could say the whole earth seeks their presence? The known world, bless you, the known world sought his presence. Solomon's recipe was that in one bowl of life, you put in feast, construction, possessions, wealth, music, physical pleasure, relationships, peace, and fame. You stir it all up, you put it in the bake, and what comes out is this meal of happiness. Now, let me ask you, does that recipe sound familiar? Like, what would we add to that? What's the other thing, like, well, he didn't have an iPhone. Oh, that'd get, like, if he just had an iPhone. I mean, what would we add? See, it's remarkable to me that, that Solomon reigned from in the late 900s B.C., which means almost 1,000 years B.C., somewhere in that range, which means that we're, like, somewhere around 3,000 years since the reign of Solomon. And you think that if we had 3,000 years to work on something, we'd get better. We would go, oh, well, you know, we've been doing this for 3,000 years. We think we've learned something. But the recipe is exactly the same that every generation in secular society has been taught. We still think that that's the right recipe. It's a problem that people have called the, the hedonic treadmill. They may have heard that term, hedonism. That's just complete immersion, whatever your heart desires. That's what he's talking about in this text, whatever your heart desires. I mean, that's, that's essentially hedonism. And the hedonic treadmill is based on the idea of a treadmill. And I hope you know what a treadmill is. It's that machine that's got a moving belt on it that's driven by a motor that you put in your house in order to hang your clothes on. But the thing about treadmills that I've noticed is that I, you can go to the gym, and they're all lined up. And you can stand on the end of the row and watch them. And they're, I mean, they're sweating. They're working as hard as they can. Even the stationary bikes, you can look at it. And you know what? Not a single one moves. Like when they're done, they're in the same place they started every single time. And that's, the, that's what a treadmill does. And the hedonic treadmill is based on this idea is that every one of us is wired with kind of a default level of happiness, a default emotional level. And happiness means doing something to cause a spike in our sense of feeling happy by going fishing sitting on the beach, getting your nails done, whatever it is. And that thing is, oh, I'm happy doing this, buying a car, getting a new outfit. That makes me happy. It makes me happy. The thing is, that hedonic treadmill is, the reality of that hedonic treadmill is, is that the happiness goes away, and then what happens? You keep, you keep hustling. You're like, okay, the next weekend I'm going to do the things that made me happy, so I, will be, I know I'm going to be happy this weekend. And you're happy for a weekend, and then, well, it goes away, and you're back on that treadmill. And it kind of creates a cycle of thinking, well, if I just, if I just keep doing more of these things that, I, that are like my happy thing to do, then I'm going to reach a point where I'm happy. And it doesn't work. We work harder to maintain our happiness, and then it becomes weary, and then we're disenchanted. We can't figure out why can I not find any lasting happiness. And the reason it's perpetuated is because every generation 
seems to have said, well, you know, when I attain those things that make you happy, I'm going to appreciate it. I'm, I'm, it's going to make a difference in me, and I'm going to be happy. So when I win the lottery, it's going to be different. It's going to make me happy because of this reason or that reason. When I buy my dream house, it's not going to be like those people who have their dream house and now, you know, just think it's terrible. It, to me, it's going to make me content. That's the thing. It's, it's going to be different for me. You know, the dream car, whatever it is, every generation says, I will be different. And here's the thing, nobody's different. We've got 3,000 years or more of evidence to say it won't be different. It's still the same treadmill, and treadmills are just treadmills. You never move. So what are we missing? Well, I think we need a better goal and a better strategy to find happiness. So I think happiness as defined by these pursuits is a very thin concept. It's a concept that is uh, an emotional thing that doesn't offer much of reward for our efforts because it fizzles away like the dew in the morning. And the strategy obviously isn't working. But here's the thing. If God does not exist, then what we're pursuing and the way we're pursuing it is frankly the best strategy we've got. I mean, you could be an Easterner and choose non-attachment that we've talked about before, which is like Greek Stoicism, which is to just say, I'm not going to pursue things that make me happy. I'm going to disconnect from everything in this world, so therefore the world won't hurt me, nor will it make me happy, and I'll just live in this place of disconnection. It just doesn't work either because we can never be that non-attached. And there's some really amazing things about this world that have been given to us to enjoy Enjoyment, joy, is a great thing. And non-attachment doesn't give you joy. What gives you joy? What gives you a happiness that has some teeth to it that lasts? Well, there's a different recipe if you want that. The recipe is designed, the assumption that God exists, and the recipe is this, to get our loves in the right order. It's not about accumulation. It's not about pursuits. It's about getting our loves, the things we love, in the right order. And it's a recipe for satisfaction, which I would say is a happiness that endures. It endures as long as we have our loves in the right order. See, what Keller would say is that the plot lines of our lives will only come to a happy ending in Jesus Christ. And this recipe really then is a strategy more than anything else, and it's a strategy based on the teachings of Augustine, who was an ancient father of the church and theologian. And what Augustine taught is that we were most fundamentally shaped not not by what we believe or think or even do, but by what we love. That shapes us more than anything else. And he observed that the heart's loves have an order to them, and that we often do this, that we often love less important things more and the more important things less. We love less important things more than they should be loved, and we love the more important things less than we should love them. And that's the reason even the best worldly success will not satisfy us because we were created for a degree of delight and fulfillment that created things cannot offer us. Keller points out the ultimate disordered love and the ultimate source of our discontentment 
is failure to love the first things first. Failure to love God supremely over everything else. C.S. Lewis, in helping us understand this concept, said, if I find my, in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. That's the point we miss frequently when we try to make things, created stuff, the source of our happiness. We were not made for those things to make us happy. We were made for a different world. We were made for God, for the kingdom of God. We were made to love him supremely. And when we recognize the design of our lives, then we can pursue the strategy that leads to a happiness that endures to satisfaction. Happiness and success, unhappiness and success, is often caused by this disorder of the love of our lives. A philosopher named Miroslav Volk put it this way, he said, attachment to God amplifies and deepens our enjoyment of the world. What he's saying is, instead of looking at the things of the world, the created things, attachment to God puts those created things in the right order. And we can enjoy them then for what they are. What he's saying is, we don't need to love, we don't have to love anything less Instead, the strategy is to learn to love God more, and then we will love other things with far more satisfaction. They will mean far more for us when we recognize that they are second, third, fourth tier order of loves in our lives. Let me suggest to you some practices that can help ensure that we stay ordered in the things that we love, that we keep love of God the supreme order of our life. One is it's a process of reflection, to remember the love that made the cross possible. The cross is the symbol of the greatest love that we've ever known. See, the gospel story is, is that God made this world good, and we screwed it up. That because of our rebellion, sin entered this world, and it broke. And we were alienated from God. No hope for eternity. The only thing we could be sure of is that we're going to spend our few days in this world, and then we'll be gone like a wisp of smoke. And God looked at us. The Father looked at us and said, I can't stand that. And he said to his son, son, will you go? And the son, out of his, the love he had for his father and also for us, said, I will go. And in going, paid the greatest price any of us have ever even thought of paying, much less being willing to actually do. He was a perfect man without flaw who did not need to die for himself because he was perfect, chose to die for imperfect, sinful people so that we could become children of God, no longer alienated, and restored to spiritual life so that we had the hope of eternity. All of that because of that first order of love. So I think to ensure that our order of love stays properly balanced, it's remember the love that made the cross possible. Second, live for the beauty of that love. It means organizing our lives around loving the creator rather than the created things. To see our lives as a mission to frame the things that we do in response to the love that made the cross possible. 
and the beauty that comes from that. I mean, it's a beautiful world to enjoy. I mean, I think pulling a peach, a ripened peach off a tree, and like biting into that thing, and it's just, the taste is incredible, and the juice just runs down your chin and all down your shirt, and it's nothing tastes like that. That's a, be- that's a beautiful thing of God's creation. It's a reflection of his love. That's a gift that's been given to us. I mean, the, the love of a wife or a husband, that intimate bond of marriage is a beautiful thing. That's part of God's good creation that's been given to us to enjoy. You can just keep going on and on. The things of this creation are just beautiful. And they're, they're beautiful because God creates beautiful things. And he created them for us to enjoy him and to find our satisfaction in him. And to frame our life around the beauty of that love, to recognize the things that we receive are just the beautiful gifts of a God we love, keeps our priority, the supreme love of God. Then the third one, it's one I've mentioned before to you, it is to live with doxology. And doxology is, uh, is a song that we sing up in the traditional service after the, us- after the offering has been taken up. And I know for a lot of us who grew up in traditional church, you associate the doxology, you know, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. That, that's like, that's the money song, isn't it? Like we take up the offering, we all stand up and like, yes, sir, we, we are grateful for that money. Well, it's more than that. That it's, it's gratitude for everything. It's praise God from whom all blessings flow. And it's, so, it's, it's about navigating life, explicitly naming the things that we have that are good and saying praise God from whom, whom all blessings flow. For this, I experience, is a reflection of the bountiful goodness of God. And I say that again, as I, I mentioned a few weeks back, I think. I can't remember exactly when, but um, I was reminded of that this weekend. We did a funeral for a guy named Don Scarborough Sr. He's a member of this church, been here for a long time. He and Celia, Celia died about three years ago. He and Celia were like the walking epitome of like a phenomenal couple. This way they loved each other was amazing. It was just a delight to watch, like the sweetest thing ever. <clears throat> and he, and he, uh, he, he, he was, by all means, incredibly successful. I mean, he had great family, loved him, had, had all the material things, and he, and he had a phenomenal career. He worked for Lockheed Martin, who was in their Skunk Works area, which uh, sounds kind of weird, but that was a name that Lockheed had for their R&D department that would create new things. And so Don was part of the group that created the SR-71 Blackbird, that spy plane that flew 85,000 feet at Mach 3.5. Remember, uh, li- listening to a... a Blackbird pilots say, he says, you know, there's nothing like being lost when you're lost at 3.5 Mach, Mach 3.5. I mean, they had to navigate by mountain ranges and not by roads and coasts. They're going that fast. He, 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 he was on a team that created the C-130 plane, the C-5 Galaxy, that big lumbering thing, that you think, how does that stay afloat or in the air? It's like a bumblebee, you know. It's like it just doesn't seem like it's going to work. And then they put them over the head of the unmanned aerial vehicle, the drone program of Lockheed. And, and this is stuff that he can talk about. He can get on a plane, they fly him to Area 51, boarded up plane, fly him to Area 51 where he'd work on stuff, you know, that place that everybody wants to go to. He, uh, he, and he never saw an alien. I asked him that several times. And, and then they fly him back to L.A. or wherever, down there in Southern California. I mean, he did everything. He could walk into a cocktail party and go, you know what I did in my life? And start naming off things, and like everybody would like, oh, and just gather around him and listen. But that's not how he lived his life. He lived his life completely different. He, he would talk about that if you asked him. But he had this humility about his life that was a reflection of something different. It was a reflection of he lived his life as a doxology. And literally, like he was so focused on recognizing the good he received and thanking God for that, that that song was like one of his favorite songs to sing. That's why we concluded a funeral for the first time that I've ever been a part of, singing the doxology. 
He would get up in the morning and they'd sing the doxology. Any kind of special gathering, he'd sing the doxology. And when he was on hospice, and I would go visit him, and even the times where he was hard to communicate with them, they could, you know, something there, but you couldn't quite know what was going on. It was the deal. Like his family said, we got to sing the doxology. So sometimes it was a duet with me and, and uh, Don Jr. And then sometimes a trio when his daughter Melinda would join in. And I mean, you know, like, it wasn't good. You know, and it's, it's like three marginally talented singers trying to sing a cappella, the doxology. But when we did, you could see his face change. And kind of a smile was sort of emerged for a moment. Because that was how he lived his life. You want to order your loves correctly. To remember the love that made the cross possible. To frame your life in response to the beauty of that love and all the beauty that it offers. And to live in doxology. To recognize every single thing from whom all blessings flow. It's a beautiful gift of the Creator. With that, when you know the love of the Father, you know, the beauty of the life he's offered us, the gifts he's offered us, and you love that, you will find a satisfaction, a happiness that endures better than the best strategies for happiness, anything offered under the sun in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to see that happiness, that possibility for happiness. We've chased it a long time. For a lot of us, it's meant broken hearts and um, regrets and misgivings. But I pray, God, there's just somebody here today who has not yet understood just the power of the love of the cross, the beauty of a life lived framed around that love, that you would meet them today, that you would help them find the best end in their pursuits of finding happiness. That is in satisfaction when the road brings us to Jesus Christ. God, grant that opportunity. May this day be a day where the past followed change and the path becomes to love you supremely. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.